Welcome. It's good to see everybody here this morning, and um, it's good to have George and Sarah back home. And we've got we've got some other folks still traveling, and uh, so it's just good to see everybody. Good to see our visitors this morning. Uh, we got a visitor from the UK here this morning, so we're sure sure glad to have him. And um, I want to thank the uh, the Lichties again for opening their home yes. yesterday, and all the all the work that goes into that. And uh, it was a blessing and um, a, a great day. Um, you know, we were praying about the weather, and um, uh, you know, when I left my house, you know, it was really a lot of the morning. The sun was shining. Robert was telling me at his place it was cloudy all day, and at the Lichties it was very cloudy until two o'clock. And it was like the Lord just literally just. Whoosh. And uh, the rest of the day was absolutely beautiful. So praise the Lord and thank everybody that prayed about that. Um, if you have not turned your phones off, if you could help us with that, we would really appreciate that. And we will dismiss all the little guys eight and under at this time to go to their class. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to Acts chapter 16. We're going to look at uh, several places this morning along the way. 16. Acts 16. Acts 16. Acts 16, verse 1. Then came he to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewish, Jewess and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well, well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters. For they knew all that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily, 
Now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being here this morning. And we pray you'd bless your word. We pray that you'd bless it to our hearts. We pray you would help us, Lord, each and every one. And um, God, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, Paul here has a, a vision in uh, verse 9 and 10. It specifically uses the word vision. And um, we're going to talk about visions today. Um, you know, there are two types of visions. The first type would be what you see here. They are mystical and supernatural. Uh, you're there in Acts 16. Turn back to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, verse 9. It says, On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh into the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. Now, the word trance there, and you looked it up into the old, in the old dictionary, it is a state in which the soul seems to have passed out of the body into heavenly places, and it's transported into a vision. So Peter's up on the housetop, and he went up there to pray. In verse 10, it says he falls into a trance, verse 11, and saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. So, so the heavens open and then he hears this voice. Look at verse 14. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Verse 17. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. So you see here, you know, the, the vision that you so often see in the Bible, where guys in various places, Old Testament, New Testament, you see they, they had a vision. And um, man, they they saw something and it was like suddenly they were in another world and um, they, they saw into the spirit world. They saw what would normally be invisible. I mean, you know, there is an invisible world that is around us and it's always there. Uh, but normally, uh, and for most of us always, that is invisible. But when these guys had a vision, it was like suddenly they, they could see behind that, that curtain and spiritual things were revealed. In the Bible, those things are exceptional and they're rare. Um, it is not the norm. It's not intended to be the norm. And you never find in the Bible where um, people were 
uh, encouraged to look for a vision. And there's a real danger with a vision. Um, and that is, you know, when somebody's seen something that seems so amazing, you know, they feel so privileged. They feel, you know, the, the feelings are, uh, you know, always amazing. And the danger is that the devil counterfeits all that. Um, and you see that in the world. You know, one of the highest experiences in some of the Eastern religions is called nirvana. And that suddenly where, you know, this person, their spirit leaves their body. And, um, you know, there are drug users that, you know, they hallucinate and all that. And, um, and they, um, they see, they see visions, they see things that are not there, but the Lord gave a safeguard. The Lord gave several safeguards, um, regarding that. And so look in Isaiah chapter eight for just a moment, Isaiah chapter eight. Isaiah chapter 8. Notice verse 19. And when they shall say unto you, seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead? You know, um, uh, there is this thing, and of course it's very prevalent in our society, um, and that is, you know, people looking for mysterious experiences. Um, there's a lot of that in the New Age movement. Um, and a lot of that is on the dark side. And they're, they're looking for something. And the Lord says here in verse 20, he says, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not, According to this word, it is because there is no light in them. You know, of course, nobody in this room would, uh, at least as far as I know, would be looking on the dark side, you know, would be uh, going to a seance or going to a medium or anything like that. And um, and yet sometimes there's some of God's people that they're uh, they're looking for that or they're hoping for that. And sometimes they seem to experience that. Um, the Lord said one of the, the, the ways that that is tested is, is it's got to match what this Bible says. You know, uh, if that, if that um, spirit or that vision or whatever is somehow leading you in a different direction than what the Bible says, you, you immediately know um, it's not just that they're off. It's, it's the Lord says there is no light in them. And the Lord says, you need to look to the law and to the testimony. The word of God is superior to all your visions. Um, you know, as a church, we really, we believe that most of those things, uh, for the most part, they ended uh, in the days of the early church. Um, Paul said the days would come when tongues would cease. We know that most of this book was written from a Jewish perspective, uh, and um, the gospel went to the Jew first and also to the Greek. God said he used visions and signs and wonders to bear witness unto his truth. And the Jews were looking for that. And the Bible says that the Jews require a sign. And that's, when, and that's why when the Lord Jesus came, as he walked the earth, man, he did miracles and wonders and signs. Uh, Nicodemus said, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do the works that thou doest except God be with him. And they, they recognized that. But the word of God is superior to visions. If you're familiar with church history, it appears that there are times through history where once in a while God has done that again. Um, 
And I, I wouldn't deny that. There's too many accounts of where God just supernaturally, when it was needed, and often it was in a place where people had no scripture, and they they had no written scripture, and, and God would do supernatural things for them. John Wesley tells the story of um, a woman whose husband had been jailed over there. And of course, you know, we're talking in the, the 1700s. And uh, he was condemned to die. And uh, his death was approaching. And it was the night before his death. And she said she was sitting in front of the fire, of course, bemoaning and grieving over her husband's execution that was coming the next day. And it was for something political. It was not, uh, you know, it wasn't, he had not committed a crime of any kind, really. It was just, and in those days, and even to this day in so many parts of the world, human life just has no value. And um, she was sitting in front of the fire, bemoaning, you know, grieving. And she said she dozed off. When she dozed off, she had a dream and suddenly she she saw a wall and she recognized the wall. It was some distance away from her. It was at a public place. And um, a person in that dream said, pull away those bricks. And they pulled away the bricks and there was a key. And, um, and the voice said to her, this key will release your husband. And so she woke up and she thought, oh my word, what, you know, I'm just, I'm just, you know, you know how we are with our dreams. And uh, the Bible says a dream coming through the multitude of business. You know, our, in divers' dreams are divers' vanities. Most of our dreams are just sheer vanity. Um, but she said she woke up and she thought, man, I'm just eat up with my husband's approaching death. And she said, I'm just, I'm just dreaming. She sat there for a few more minutes and she fell asleep again. And she said this time she had the same exact dream again. She thought, this is crazy. She thought, I'm going to go check out that wall. And she went to the spot. And sure enough, there was the spot on the wall that she dreamed about. And there were the two or three loose bricks she saw in her dream. She pulled it away and there was a key. She managed to get somebody to her husband with that key. And in the wee hours of the night, that key unlocked his cell door and he escaped. You know, there have been supernatural things like that. Um, any of you that have read anything about Corey Ten Boom, you know, and I know Corey Ten Boom was on that charismatic side of the fence, and I understand all that. But man, was she ever a bold witness for Jesus Christ? And um, and she really did try to spend her life uh, trying to win people to Jesus Christ. There was a plane that she was on, and the plane caught on fire. And uh, man, she stood up and and just started talking to everybody, you know, in that moment. And that's just the kind of woman that she was. And um, you'll read in her, her works of dreams that she had, uh, you know, and all that stuff. Um, but the problem is there is there, those things are very unusual and they're very rare and they're very exceptional. You know, even the thing of tongues, Paul said tongues would cease. And he said in 1 Corinthians 14, tongues are for a sign. And again, the signs are for Israel. And yet once in a while through history, somebody somewhere is in a place. You know, I've read several stories of a guy that's standing up in front of a group and he wants to preach the gospel to them. And they he doesn't speak their language and there's no interpreter and he just begins to preach, and suddenly their eyes light up, and they are understanding him. Well, that's the book of Acts all over again. You know, God can do anything he wants. But the Bible is superior to all visions. I want you to turn with me to um, 2 Peter chapter 1. You can always tell when a vision is not from the Lord, and that is when the person believes it, accepts it, and it derails them for the rest of their life. I mean, they're, they're superior to the Word of God. They're superior to their teachers. They're, uh, 
they go off and they're all they can talk about from that day on is their vision. And you know what? They're useless for the kingdom of God from that day on. You know what that was? That was counterfeit. Second Peter chapter one, verse 16. Now, Peter, in this passage, he's going to refer back to what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration. And they literally saw the glorified Christ for a few minutes and they saw Moses and Elijah. And it was an unbelievable vision. And that vision at that same moment, it was actually reality. Peter here is at the end of his life and he refers back to that day. 2 Peter 1, verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were, here it is, eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he, Jesus, received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the Holy Mount. Peter said, you know, I never forgot that day. But verse 19, we have now, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, more sure than the voice from heaven. Whereunto, Ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So he, he goes from talking about the man of transfiguration and then he's talking about the scripture. And when he talks about the scripture, he says, we have a more sure word of prophecy. You know, the word of God is superior to all visions. Man, there's a bunch of religious groups out there that they have a leader or a prophet. We were actually talking about this yesterday or a prophetess. And they had a vision. And you know what they did? They've added something to God's word. They've added their revelation. You know, they saw something and, um, and they added to the Bible. Look at Revelation 22. You're right there in 2 Peter. And just go to the, the last book in the Bible, Revelation 22. Revelation 22. Verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. A pretty severe warning. And you might say, well, pastor, that's just talking about the book of Revelation. Well, you'll find... Uh, nearly the same words in Deuteronomy chapter 4. You find them again in Proverbs 30 verse 5. You find it at the beginning of the Bible. You find it in the middle of the Bible. You find it at the end of the Bible. And God says, if anybody adds, and man, there's a pile of them out there. And they've got their own religious sect and they've got their own religious books. And, and you know what? Some will say, well, you know, we believe this too. But, and God says, if you add to this book, God says he has plagues that he will add to you. Um, so the word of God is superior to any of those kind of mystical visions. You know, a lot of people, a vision has been their undoing. A number of years ago, we were um, going on visitation and uh, I was with a friend and he said, um, I want you to come with me. He said, I want to visit a friend of mine. And he said he was a Mormon missionary. And he said he's still a Mormon, but he said he's, he's one of my friends. And he said, I've talked to him about the Lord. And he said, Let, let's go see him. So we went 
And uh, we knocked on his door, and this guy came to the door. He was mid to late 20s, real nice guy. We had a great conversation there. My friend was doing the talking. And my, my friend said to him, he said, um, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. And my friend stressed it just like that. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And, and the, the Mormon young man, you know, normally when they're, when they're at your door, they agree with everything you say. Well, this guy, we were visiting him. And so immediately he piped up. He felt free to disagree. And, um, and he said, the Bible doesn't say that. Not of works. He said, the Bible. And he said, yes, it does. He said, where does it say that? And my friend opened his Bible and says, right here. He turned around and showed it to him. And you can tell he just looked at it. He, he didn't know what to say. And then he said this. He said, you know, he said, I really think I'm okay. He said, a year or so back, a little while back, he said, uh, I was in my house by myself and I opened my closet. And he said, all of a sudden, Jesus was standing in front of me in the closet. He said, he was standing there and he was dressed in white. And he said, he never said a word. But he said, but when I saw him, I knew that everything was okay. You know what that vision did? Maybe God's opened his eyes since then. Maybe he's come to a census. But you know what that vision did? If, if nothing ever changed, he's clinging to that vision. And he denies the scripture because of what he saw in his vision. Uh, the word of God trumps everything. It trumps everybody. It trumps every religion. It trumps all your relatives. It trumps everything you were ever taught. It, it trumps every good feeling or bad feeling or whatever you ever had. Um, a vision is some people's undoing. There are two types of visions. First of all, there's the supernatural vision. But secondly, there's another type of vision. And we use this expression a lot. We'll say, you know, so-and-so has a, a vision for his project. You know, she has a, a vision for what she wants to accomplish. They have a vision of where they want things to go in the future. And when we use that expression, we're talking about an idea, a mental picture, you know, what we think it will look like. In the old dictionary, when you look up the word vision, of course, it mentions the supernatural vision. And then it also says to see by clear thinking. You're seeing, but you're, you're not you're not seeing with your eyes. You know, you're talking to somebody, you're explaining something and then they go, oh, I see. I get it. The Bible says that Moses endured as seeing him who is invisible. In Acts chapter 2, David said, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. Does that mean that David walked around and, and he literally was always seeing the Lord's face right in front of him? No, it means he kept the Lord in front of him. There was an, a picture, there was an awareness that the Lord was very near at all times. Paul said, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Whenever I hear that verse, I think of, um, you know, those those glass, uh, you know, a lot of bathrooms have them. It's a, it's a sort of a, a fog glass and it, it lets light through. You know, and somebody could stick their face up against it. And you could tell you could tell somebody's there, but you couldn't tell who it was. Um, and that's our our. Our vision of eternal things, you know, of heaven, of what's coming. Um, we, we've got a really good idea, we think. And we do have a good idea. The Lord's told us a lot. But you've never seen it with your eyes. Now you see through a glass darkly. But then face to face. I say all that this morning because... 
when you when you go through the Bible, and especially when you go through the book of Acts, man, these guys, uh, Paul had several visions. And there's some visions that you need, and you need them now. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Go to Acts 6 with me first. You are not likely to ever see anything, uh, you know, really visibly supernatural. It is not likely. But there are some visions that God wants you to have. There's some things he wants you to wrap your head around. There's some things that he wants you to see with that eye of faith. There's some things he wants you to keep in front of you. We talk, you know, we say, uh, you know, the, the lights came on. There's some things the Lord wants you to understand. Look at Acts chapter 6. We're going to read several verses here. Acts chapter 6, verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians and of them of Cilicia and of Asia disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suborned men. That means they paid them to lie. Then they suborned men which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon them and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses, which said, this man ceaseth not to, to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all the people that sat in the council and all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Chapter seven. Then said the high priest, are these things so? And so Stephen answers, and he said, Men, brethren and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Charan. And he starts going on. Go down to verse 54 of chapter 7. So Stephen speaks to the people um, and he just um, confronts them with all their rebellion against God. And in verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and he sees something and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. In verse 58, it says, they laid their clothes down at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul was consenting into his death. Saul was just right with the, the group there, right on board. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judah and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women. That means seizing them by force. Hailing men and women, committed them to prison. And goes on. Look at chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest 
and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round, round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the priest, the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. So Saul has this vision, verse 7. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in a vision, another vision, a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. You know, uh, you just read through there and it's just vision after vision. Uh, the vision I want to emphasize here is um, that, uh, man, Saul is on his way to persecute the church. And the Lord Jesus from heaven, I mean, Saul is not seeking a vision of any kind. Paul is on a mission, and it's an ugly one. And uh, the Lord steps in his way and reveals himself, blinds him, brings him down to the ground, and starts talking to him. And Saul has this vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it changes his whole life. Um, Saul was an enemy of Jesus Christ. He was the enemy of all that would follow Jesus. And Saul had a vision of who Jesus is. And why he needed him. And it was personal. And um, if you're in here without Jesus Christ. You, you need that same vision. Um, you need a vision of who Jesus really is and why you need him and why this must be personal. For so many people and for so many people in church this morning all over our city, you know, in a lot of places they talked about Jesus. They heard his name. They heard about God. They heard a Bible story. And it was all nice. It was maybe even moral. It maybe was instructive, but it was not personal to them. There was no personal encounter. They understand nothing of a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. And if you've been raised in our kind of church, that just seems so bizarre to you and me because we've experienced that. Man, there was a day and there was an hour. Maybe you were a kid. Maybe you were a teenager. Maybe you were grown up. And man, God drew near to you and you didn't see him with your eyes, but he spoke to your heart. You heard the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And you trembled in your heart at the wrath of God and at your sin. And you heard the blessed story of the escape through Jesus Christ. And man, you responded. You know what you responded? You responded to him. He drew near to you. He came to where you were. A songwriter years ago wrote a song. And he said, when I could not come to where he was, he came to me. Saul is on his journey, and he's not looking for God. But the Lord Jesus decided, I think I'm going to meet him today. I'm going to go. And you know, it, the Lord didn't force his hand. The Lord didn't force anything. It, it was still going to be, Saul was going to make a choice. You know, every one of you in this room, um, and perhaps on many occasions, the Lord has drew near to you. And man, your heart trembled. You know, you heard the gospel, you heard the truth. And oftentimes there's, you know, unless you get saved as a little child, sometimes there's a, there's something that looms up in front of you. It's a shadow. You know, it's like, 
What are my friends going to think? What, what's my family going to think? And maybe you know what they're going to think. And uh, But the Lord Jesus is there. Revelation 3, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and, hey, every, every lost sinner hears Jesus' voice at some time in their life, and most hear him multiple times. You say, how can you say that, preacher? Well, John 1 says, Jesus is the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. I don't know how all that works, but I know nobody will stand in His presence on the great day and say, Lord, you never talked to me. You never gave me a chance. No, it won't be that way. And Saul was on that road. You know what? He was headed the opposite direction. He was headed to hurt the name of Jesus. And Paul said later on, he said, I did it ignorantly. Saul said, I, I didn't know what I was doing. He was murdering. He was killing. And you know, he was a Pharisee. A Pharisee of the Pharisees. And the law of Moses says, thou shalt not kill. But you know, I guess when you're a religious fanatic, you can kill people at will. Sound familiar? There's no new thing under the sun. There's no more barbarous, heartless thing than religion. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you know that in the jungles of New Guinea, they have a moral code? It's a remnant from the days of Moses. I'm talking about people that wear a loincloth. You know, and they rub grease on their bodies and they only live to be about 35 and they, they kill each other and cast spells on each other. And, you know, they do all sorts of crazy stuff. And I've, I've known several people. I got a friend that was in the jungles and he said, uh, he said, I can't tell you in mixed company what they do when you touch somebody else's wife. Now they'll cut each other's throat and poison each other and kill the guy in the tribe next door. But don't you touch their wife. You know what that is? In Romans, it says the law is written in their heart. And here's Paul. Very religious, but what a hater. The greatest haters are religious haters. There's no hate like religious hate. Would you look at Galatians 1 for just a moment? Well, we saw it during COVID, didn't we? We saw uh, we saw people cutting off family members, you know, because and 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 you know, have mercy with me, you know. I, I most of us in this room are on the same page, but I'm, I'm not trying to be rude, but I am making a point. Um, you know, um, you know, they they were going to cut you off if if you weren't going to wear a mask at their house. Uh, people were telling their sons and their daughters, and you know, they were saying, "Don't come over to this house unless you get vaccinated." Don't, don't ever come back to my house. That's just a little bit nuts if you ask me. Like a whole lot nuts. They were willing to cut people off. I got a friend of mine grew up in a certain religion. And, um, and when he, and, and, and a North American religion, by the way, uh, very prominent here in North America. And uh, he, uh, he got saved, and he was working at a spa, and he was selling memberships. It was at a, a spa, a, a, weight, a weight place, and it had a spa connected to it. And uh, he was a young guy in his early 20s, and it was his job to get people to buy a membership. If they came in as a, you know, a one-time user or a visitor, then he would try to talk them into buying a membership. So that's what he did. And he said, I, I made friends. He said there was this big, great, big strapping weightlifter and he said he, he was just one of those monsters, you know, and he would come in and we would chat. And he said that one day he sat down across the table from me and he said, hey, he said, uh, if you died tonight, he said, do you know where you go? And my friend said, oh, yeah, I think I'd go to heaven. And he said, why do you think that? And he said, well, I grew up in such and such a religion, this and, that and the other. And he said, he said, dude, he said, has anybody ever showed you from the Bible what it is to go to heaven? He said, No. He said, can I show you? He said, sure. 
So right there in the spa at his table, people are walking by, and he opens his Bible, and he starts walking him through just some of the simple verses on salvation. He said, by the time we were done with that conversation, he said, man, the lights came on. He saw it. Oh, he saw it. He had been blind all his life. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was blind, but now I see. He saw it. He saw he was lost. And all of a sudden, he sensed a person knocking at his door. And he bowed his head right there in that spa. And he opened his heart and he said, man, he said, I, I let Jesus in. He said, and I got the real thing. And he said, I was so happy to be saved. He said, I realized in that moment, you know, just you talk about revelation. You t a vision is about sight. We say, how's you go to the doc and they check your vision. You know, they, how well can you see? He said, man, I got saved. He said, I got saved. And literally in the next few minutes, all the lights came on. And he said, I understood. I had been lied to all my life in the religion of my family. And he said, I thought, I've got to go tell my family. They will be thrilled to hear how they can be saved from hell. And they're on their way to hell. And they don't even know it. And he went home and told them all they were going to hell. And told them that they needed Jesus. And you know how thrilled they were? They kicked him out of the house. <laughs> and for many moons, they had nothing to do with him. You know what that is? That's religion. Hey, when you get the Lord Jesus, the love of God is shed abroad in your heart. And there's nobody that you don't want to go to heaven. You know, somebody comes up and says, well, I disagree with you. You know, I think you're an idiot. You know, besides that, you're ugly. And, and, and you know, and, and your book's a bunch of junk and all that stuff. I don't want to pull out a pistol and blow his brains out. I want to help him. If one of my children went crazy... I say it with fear and trembling. If one of my children went crazy and went off the deep end, am I going to hate them? Am I going to look at them and say, well, you've shamed the family. Get out of here. No. I'm going to fall on my knees in grief and compassion and pray that God will open their eyes. And you know what I know part of that is? I got to love them. And I got to do all I can to help them. That's what Jesus does. See, religion doesn't do that. Religion creates walls and hate. I, I got a question. What do you got this morning? Can you see? Can you see what you have? Do you understand? You need a vision. You need a vision. Look at Galatians 1, verse 8. Paul said this about some people that were trying to mess people up on the way of salvation. Paul said this in Galatians 1, verse 8. But though we or an angel from heaven. Now there's a vision for you. An angel comes and knocks at your door and says, you've got it wrong. You need to join the cult group on 39th street. Now you laugh at that, but I'm telling you an angel standing there. It's the middle of the night. <coughs> you wake up and all of a sudden this shining being in white is standing in front of you. <laughs> By the way, they're almost always in white. The Bible says Satan can transform himself into an angel of light. It never dawns on these people that there might be a deception going on. Never. They, they so live by their feelings. And when you live by your feelings, you know how you live? Blind. Because you don't see anything. You just feel. You know what a blind man does? He feels his way along. you got to learn to see. An angel comes and says, and you, and you just feel such peace. None of these people that have these visions say, I saw this angel. And you know, he had fangs. And I felt like I was in hell. But I thought, I need to follow this guy. Do you know that never happens? Now, some people have visions like that, and that's, and that's another story. But, there, but, you know, most of the time they'll say, I just, how do you know it was right? Oh, I just, I just felt this wonderful peace. Really? Let's read the verse. 
Verse 8. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And in case you missed it, he says, I better repeat that. Verse 9. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, this is where it, this is what it comes down to. If I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. He said, you're going to have to decide who you're going to serve here. Verse 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion. How that beyond measure, he says, you have no idea. I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion. He said, I was working my way up through the ranks. Profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation. Being more exceedingly zealous, now watch the wording, of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by, by his grace to reveal his, he said, suddenly the lights came on to reveal his son in me. And then he goes on about how everything changed. He said, you know what? I was zealous. I was zealous of the traditions of my fathers. I worked in the Prince Albert Penitentiary for a little while on a volunteer program. And, uh, and I've been in a couple other prisons along the way uh, preaching. And, um, and, uh, and you know what they'll say? The chaplain will come along and, and they're, they're nice people. They are, they're well-meaning. Most of them are horribly lost, but they're very well-meaning. And they'll say, now, you know, we're, we're glad you're here. You know, we have people in our, in our, in our, in our group this morning from various traditions. You know, what, you know what the key word for religion is? Traditions. Traditions. Paul said, you know what? He said, I was exceedingly zealous. He said, I was on board 110% with the traditions of my fathers. But he said, but one day I had a vision. He said, I saw Jesus Christ. And when I saw him... I knew I was going in the wrong direction. I knew I had to abandon the traditions of my fathers. I knew it would change everything forever. But I knew when I saw Jesus Christ, He was the one. He was the one. You know what Paul saw? He saw the real Jesus. He saw the real Jesus. He saw the living, exalted, powerful Jesus. You know, Paul thought Jesus was dead. You know, they had crucified him. And, and the soldiers had told that lie throughout Jerusalem that the, that the disciples came and stole him away when he slept. Saul did not believe he was risen from the dead. But you know what? He denied that until he met him. You know what? You need a vision of the living Jesus. Is your Jesus living or is he just a story? Is he living or is he just academic? Is he just something you talk about? Is he living? He lives. Does he live in your heart? Paul met the Jesus who loved a hater. He saw the Jesus who would open his blinded eyes. He met the Jesus who would change his mission in life. He met the Jesus that would override all his traditions. You know the first vision you need this morning? is you need a vision of a real and a living Jesus. And, and it's got to be personal. Again, I ask you this morning, you, you, you know, I, I realize most of you in this room this morning, you've been raised here in, here in the truth. Most of you have. Um, and you know what you wind up in our kind of churches? You wind up with young people and some of them who become older people and they, they know all the right things. But it's, it's not personal. 
It's not personal. There is no living connection. I'm just telling you, if that's what you have this morning, you know, um, you do understand that even this morning, Jesus cares for you. He loves you. He died to save you. He knows that you're in the dark. And this morning, I've seen more than one person they'd get in a service where God was really dealing with people and they would walk away. I remember sitting across the table one day after a, after a, a church service and, and a bunch of us were sitting there eating and, and this lady was talking about her husband and, and what a wonderful, how God had turned his life around. And then she said in a moment of truthfulness and um, in a moment of transparency, she said, sometimes I wonder if I'm saved. Is that you? Can I tell you? You know what you need? You need a vision. Oh, not, not one of those spooky ones. The Lord Jesus, He wants to be real to you. And He is near. And for whosoever shall call, He's so near that if you'll call, if you believe He died for you, that He rose from the dead, that He's coming again, that He's the exalted one. If you believe He's God the Son, if you believe that, you know where He's at? He might have been knocking on your heart last night. He might have been knocking this morning. He may keep knocking throughout the day, but He's knocking. You know why that is? He wants you to hear His voice and open the door. He wants to turn the lights on. He wants this thing to become personal. He wants it to be real. Is it real to you? Have you had that vision of the Lord Jesus? The one that you need and who wants to be personal to you. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, bless your truth this morning. Lord, help that, that one or two or whoever you're dealing with. Help them, Lord, to open their heart to you. Lord, help them to open all their heart. Help them to understand the difference between religion and the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, may this thing suddenly really become all about you, Lord. Lord, let them know that you are near and that you will open their blinded eyes. In Jesus' name, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if God has spoken to you this morning, why don't you talk to him? He is near. Why don't you talk to him? To me and I will answer thee. Draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you.
Father, thank you for the Lord Jesus and thank you for the day, Lord, when we could not come to you. Lord, you came to us. Thank you, Lord. God, please work, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you.